Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Oris Ryan. I'm one of the co founders of ID8 Labs. Um, I'm extremely excited for all of you to be here with me today. In the chat, please keep telling me where you're from. I'm always fascinated. As I mentioned, I am originally from Ukraine. So if there's any Slavic people on here, Gravit, hello. Uh, I still speak the language. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, but I live in Philadelphia now for the last like 20 years. So hello if anybody here is from Philly or the East Coast. Today, we have a very special uh, uh, presentation about how to pivot into user experience. And while I can give you all the slides in the world, the, the real, I think, value will come from if you have specific questions that I can answer directly for you um, and your experiences, because that's kind of the, the thing, right? There's definitely some principles that can guide the majority of people trying to get in, but there's going to be little tips and tricks specifically for you and your needs. So I won't talk too much. Um, I apologize if I'm a little bit all over the place with Zoom, it kind of need to balance letting people in and the chat and the slides. So it's, it's, uh, gets a little hectic. So I will be paying attention to the chat. Um, if you have any questions, I will try to again, address them as best as I can. So let us begin. Don't look at my desktop. It's so messy. Okay. Pivoting into UI UX design. Uh, as a career. So again, um, I will make sure to pay attention to the chat if you have specific questions popping up. I'm a fan of kind of answering questions as we go. So if you have questions that are like popping up, let me know. Oh my God, how do I do this? Um, more about UX and feel they are cool. So a little bit about who we are. So ID Labs is a bootcamp but we are a very different kind of cohort uh, where we specialize on our participants and customize it to you and your needs. Um, the next cohort that is coming up is February 15th. Uh, so very, very soon. And the early bird closes in about a week and there's about a thousand dollar difference. We try to be extremely fair and equitable when it comes to pricing. Our current uh, fee is $5,000 for early bird and then it's $6,000 for regular bird about. Um, and where we really provide value for our students is the way that we uh, teach you for 16 weeks straight. It seems intimidating, but there's breaks. Um, ooh, sorry about that. There's breaks built in and there's a midterm and a final. And every single week you get personalized mentorship one on one. So you have a live course once a week, but you also have personalized mentorship baked in one on one every single week as much as you need. We are also extremely active in helping our students get jobs. Um, right now, our students have an 89% improvement in their salary. So that's not the return on their investment. Uh, that's a growth in their salaries. Um, if you are interested, essentially, we work with you really closely as a part of the bootcamp, but also after the bootcamp to provide things like mock interviews, Oh my goodness, I don't know how to do this. Mock interviews, um, connect you with recruiters, really chisel out your resume. And by the time you leave, we're not trying to set you up with junior, as junior designers. We're trying to take all the skills that you built in whatever profession you're in and transfer them into user experience. What does that mean? That means that we did have some folks who did graduate as complete newbies in design. So folks run from customer service, for example, to UX. So they made about, you know, uh, what is it, like a $40,000 jump. But we also have folks who went from being like creative generalists into senior UI UX designers making well, well, well over six figures. So we're not just trying to graduate designers who are baby designers, but also folks who are you know, have a thorough build out experience. We don't wanna revert back to zero to two years after graduation. All right, if that is something interesting for you to learn more about, please connect me with me on 101. Um, without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit more about, you know, why UI UX design as a profession. I'm a huge advocate of people joining user experience as a profession. I've been an advocate before we started ID Labs. Um, at ID Labs, we do specifically kind of focus on women in particular joining UI UX, women, minorities, and people of color. It is our belief that uh, the field should reflect the communities that we're trying to serve, right? So uh, we kind of want to make sure too that the field is diverse and equitable for everyone who's joining. But 
the greatest thing about UX is um, that there are so many professions built into it. And that is why it's almost like this incredible jewel of a profession for the people who discover it. I used to really like psychology and marketing and social media and graphic design. And I was like, which one do I choose? And then UX comes along and you could be everything. UX is like 30 professions baked into one. That's the best part. And that's also why it's so value adding. Um, UX is really something that looks at the user at the center, but it's also something that considers how do these changes and developments build out the bottom line for the company, right? Um, and that's why it's such a lucrative profession because it's always like great design decisions not only benefit the user, but they also significantly benefit the company financially. You can be so many different professions in UI UX. Um, you can of course be the thorough UX designer. We'll talk about, you know, kind of like what that looks like is essentially you're creating wireframes. You really think about the strategy. You're really looking at that, like the skeleton of the product. You can of course be a thorough UI designer. So that's more of the visual side. Um, you can, of course, focus on the product, copywriting, UI engineering. So that's if you are good at code. Now, all of these have slightly different price points and all that. Um, if you need to ask me questions about like recommended salaries, please feel free. But the, the point is that in all of these different professions, if you really, really particularly enjoy a subset of it, you can actually be a professional in it. So if you really enjoy copywriting, you could be UX writer, right? You can be responsible for the copy. Um, if you like coding, you can be a UI or UX engineer. So you could actually combine those two skill sets. Um, even interaction, you could be a thorough interaction designer. So focus on like the, the movement and the flow. And the best part is that UX, because of how many fields are kind of baked in, it does pay quite well. So on average, um, if you're graduating in Philly with zero to one years of experience, it's about $60,000. Averages can be misleading, I will admit. Right now, there's not like a single source of truth. At ID Labs, we kind of just push people to, to ask for more. And if a company says no, then there's your standard, right? Um, but in Philly, it's about $60,000. Um, after a couple of years, you could get 80, 90, et cetera. In New York, it's about 73 for somebody who's just starting out as a designer. And then Boston is 69. I should probably also review um, the West Coast and the Midwest, but uh, the prices are quite similar. And I have to warn you, if you're making less than like 55 or 60 uh, as a designer in a company, no matter where, even the like depths of nowhere, please get out of that profession because they are significantly underpaying you, right? I know that's easier said than done. I can help you, but um, UX compensates a lot because you do a lot. Um, and the great thing is that, in fact, a lot of the things that you all do on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if any of you are like graphic designers or website designers or something kind of creative, actually translates really well into the technical skills that you need for UX and UI. Or if you're somebody who is not in a creative field, you have a lot of soft skills that I bet will transfer really, really well. And we'll talk about that too, about how to like chisel those skills out and really showcase them in your portfolio. Jen says you're highly, girl, we got you. If I can help you with anything, uh, I'll share the Slack info because yes, um, here's the thing. Uh, the rising tide lifts all ships, right? If you get a better job, the person after you gets a, a good job and a good standard, right? We cannot let design be watered down by these companies that are like, oh, I'll give you 40,000. New, no. if there's like a million things I'm responsible for, um, we're, you're gonna give me 60, 70, 80, right? So a rising tide lifts all ships. Uh, I am, when I was considering what field to go into, I was really nervous. I'm a self-taught designer in case anybody is like, is it possible? Yes, it is, it's possible to pivot. Um, I was considering like marketing and social media and graphic design, like pure, you know, pure um, fields like that. And I was really nervous about the money part because a lot of these fields, because they're creative are completely disrespected. They shouldn't be, they bring in so much value to the company, right? Each and every one of these fields, social media, graphic design, marketing brings in so much value, but because they're like seen as creative, um, people are like, oh, my little niece can do that. No, she can't. But unfortunately, because people kept accepting these low rates because we all have to live, like this is not a judgment zone. I understand people need to survive and live, but because we kept accepting low rates, 
the rates kept going down, 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 right? So just be cautious with what kinds of rates you accept as UI UX designer and don't, don't get undersold. So a blueprint to getting into the career. I recommend taking at least one course. It doesn't have to be our course. I will admit it could be any course, any course that fits your budget or fits your needs. There's a reason for this. And the reason is that UX is, albeit, yes, it's a very creative um, environment, but there's also because of the UX research and UX, it's quite an academic back field as well. For me, I don't know if anybody else can relate. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there's a question. Do you need a portfolio if you're interested in design? Um, so are you interested in research? Um, Sorry, so essentially research or strategy, yes, your portfolio would just look different, but you would, so with really senior researchers, um, I've spoken to like a mentor literally five days ago, and I was like, do you have a portfolio? He's like, not anymore, right? At first, you'll need one, at first. My partner has one with like 60 case studies, uh, yes. Your portfolio will look different from the visual portfolios, but yes, just to get you started. As you keep going, probably not. You'll have such a, a like a network to get jobs, but at first, yes. And then also a lot of your stuff will be NDA'd anyhow. Um, but just to go back to this, because of the research, because of the academic background, this for many visual folks is an area of challenge. For me, it was, it sometimes still is a little chip on my shoulder where I'm like, oh, I'm not classically trained as a designer because I don't have the, the research acumen at times. But in reality, all it is, is just understanding which ingredient out of the, the many, many spice uh, drawers to pick out which spices to pick out for this specific meal that you're making, which is this project, right? You're, it's all about picking out the exact ingredients to put them together in a way that will, you know, uh, give you a great result of a project or product. The challenging thing about UX is there is no right or wrong solution. I mean, there's some wrong solutions for sure, but in reality, it's all about seeing which solution benefits the user, the company, if it's the time, it has to be feasible, viable, it has to be affordable. You have to work within the parameters. So a UX course, one UX course will just demonstrate kind of like the steps that you need to take. Because by the way, having those steps in your mind will also allow you to answer the question, which will be asked in most interviews, which is, tell me about your design process. By the way, the design process, for those of you who get asked this, is quite similar. It's pretty much the same thing over and over and over again, it's the design process but you have to answer it with the flavors that you bring to the process, right? So doing a course, or at least like seeing the project from beginning to middle to end, will kind of let you understand like how to pick out the right strategies and tools and how that will influence your final decision. Um, another really important tip is to really make a self-study into a discipline. Um, I have a couple of these books actually on my table right now, and I'm trying to read them all. Right there and there's the Bible, this guy, right? So these are some books that you could pick apart. Frankly, I'm a big learner on the like via projects. So it's you don't have to fit into any sort of like a uh yeah, stuffy nice. You don't have to fit into any sort of like a description of a designer, right? We can think of designer as just like moody, coffee drinking black wearing museum junkie, right? No, it's not like that. You can be any kind of designer as long as you're learning um, and learning a lot, learning daily. I prefer to re uh, learn, excuse me, by doing a project rather than trying to learn a skill. It's almost like my brain is just like fighting the skill, right? So for example, if I was like, Steffi, you need to learn design systems. You can be like, oh, I don't want to do that. But what if I'm like, let me teach you how to make a design system for this project that we could do together, right? Let's learn how to do that. All of a sudden you're like, okay, cool. I'm solving a problem. I'm solving a challenge. Like this could be really nice. And that way you could address specific books to be like, well, how would designing interfaces, what would this book uh, say to the challenges that I'm experiencing, right? You have actionable questions you can search for in these books. Whereas if I'm like, just read the book and see what happens, right? You can be like, that's great, Chris. Now what, right? So I always say, learn a skill or excuse me, solve for a challenge, don't learn a skill, English. Um, 
And Samantha asks, if you go the self-taught route, self route, how do you show this to potential companies? Sorry, when you say this, what do you mean by the word this? What do you show that you are self-taught or can you elaborate on that? <clears throat> There's also a million and a half articles out there on design. Again, same thing, please try to solve for a challenge and then Google like, okay, how to make a really good landing page, how to make a good calculator. Like, you know what, these actionable questions. Um, because then these articles will become so much more um, like usable in your mind. What's the word I'm looking for? It's not usable, but the app more like applicable. So that was, by the way, one of the reasons why I never pursued a master's degree right out of college or even kind of now is because the real world is so tangible. Whereas a lot of times in like a, a master's degree, sometimes it's just like super, super nebulous. It's like, here's all the information about design. But how does it relate to design? How are we actually solving real life projects? And that was always my big fear. And so far, so good. Um, Samantha asks, uh, show that you are self-taught and have the skills, I guess, find volunteering experiences. Yes, and I could tell you how to do that, how to find projects for your portfolio, because yes, it's all about displaying the work. Um, I always equate it to cooking, frankly. Um, let's say you were like, I'm a chef. And I'm like, well, tell me, show me that you're a chef. And you're like, no, no, I'm a chef. I'm like, well, I know you're a chef. I'm sure you're a chef. Show me. How would you show me that you're a chef? You would probably have to cook. You'd have to make something for me, right? If you could make a delicious meal, if you could show me that you created something beautiful, aesthetically, but also delicious and nourishing, then voila, you're a chef. Who's to tell you that you need to go to a culinary school to become a chef, but you need to put something out into the world for the world to acknowledge that you are a chef. So we'll talk about how to um, add those portfolio pieces and companies want a certificate qualification. They don't, they don't want a certificate. Certificates, can I be really honest with you guys? Um, they, a certification of any kind alone is not going to get you a job. Like for example, I went to Temple University. Raise your hand if you know where Temple University is, right? Who knows what these uh, universities are and Philly, okay, don't respond. <laughs> um, but knowing that I'm from Temple is in itself not going to get me a job, right? Oh, Jesse, very nice. Like, just because I went to some place that taught me some things, that doesn't mean that I'm instantaneously going to get a job. I need to do extra steps to showcase my, like, UX knowledge, because just having, like, a stamp of approval on your resume from any, you know, any place is not alone going to get you a job. So that's kind of, like, why I'm not super fond of certifications. Even IDA Labs, we don't tell our students to put IDA Labs on their portfolio. I don't, I don't care. That's not going to get you a job. It's the skills that we give you and it's the, the portfolio pieces and the way that you're able to think about projects and, and processes. That's what's going to get you a job. Um, that's also my opinion about Google UX certification, frankly, but that's a different conversation. Uh, Norman Nielsen Group, fantastic resource. By the way, I use this a lot, if, especially if I don't have research. Uh, or a researcher working with me. So a lot of times I would look up like um, best case or best way to do X, Y, Z. And a lot of times they're really rooted in science. So they'll say like, oh, we did this research that shows that you need five participants for interviews, right? And you could take that knowledge to your stakeholders and say, oh, there's some research that was done, right? So this is a really great place to find um, articles. I think case study says the documentary project they apply. Yes, 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 document everything. So I'll send out these slides, but there's also a list apart, which by the way, they make really great books. Um, so let's talk about building out your portfolio because your portfolio will be one of the components that is crucial for you to get a job. No matter what you're going into, UX, UI, research, whatever, you need a portfolio. It's going to be the beginning of the discussion with the hiring managers and the, the UX team. So it's invaluable. So number one is look at the experience that you have right now, because UX designers, you know, a lot of times we're not made in the womb. Like we are people who had to be created out of something. You have a bunch of experiences and skills and you rebrand them to be a UX designer. UX, by the way, is a, a profession that is 50 years old. The word user experience was coined by Jacob Nielsen and Don Norman. These guys, right? UX really existed since the dawn of time. I mean, it's user experience. It's how human beings experience a product or a service. 
right? So that's been around forever, but they actually coined the term and defined what it means. All that being said is we're still doing the same thing. You take the terms that you use on a daily basis to describe yourself and your skill set, and you rebrand them, redevelop uh, them essentially to fit UX. So if you've ever done things like interviews for your job, or you've sent out surveys for a newsletter, or you've sat down with people to, you know, in a group setting, that's a focus group, you did research. Congratulations, right? Like you've done UX research. Like that's a skill that you have. I mean, maybe there's some things that you need to chisel out, but you've done it. Or for example, if you've done like uh, business process modeling, I don't know what that is, but you've done a UX workflow. So essentially if you've looked at, for example, how a user interacts with the products and services, you've done a user flow, pardon me, um, and a user journey, which are fantastic and amazing skills to have on your resume and your portfolio, because we use, for example, in my job, we use storytelling every single day, every day, to do, to really understand and put ourselves in the shoes of a user. Uh, Jen asks, so should we update our resume to note it in this manner, or is that misleading? No, it's not misleading. You did it. It's rebranding. It's not misleading because you've done it. And there might be some things that you need to learn or like improve upon for sure. Like to, let's say you have a certain amount of skills like with resume or excuse me, with um, interviews. What I would do is I would keep on learning how to make the, uh, how to perform the best UX interviews, right? You've done some interviews in your experience, figure, now build on those skill sets to really solidify that UX background. No, you're not gonna leave a sour taste uh, while interviewing, I promise. You actually, you, like, first of all, designers, by the way, are like the nicest people. If you meet a bad designer, just walk the other way because that would be bad. Uh, new mantra for 2022, no bad work environments, but designers generally are some of the nicest people you'll ever work with. Um, what if uh, you did UX research in college, but it was a class project, work with real client or design website, should I mention the student project? You can, um, but yeah, that's a project. That's a portfolio piece. You've done the work. Again, can you cook a delicious meal? Then you're a chef, right? Like who's, you don't need anybody's permission to call yourself a chef or a designer. If you could design, you're a designer. If you could do research, you're a researcher. Now, again, definitely look up Nielsen Norman Group and understand like, what are they describing in terms of what makes a really great interview or really great survey or whatever, like whichever uh, skill you're trying to really work out. Make sure to do it again, if you can, if you really need that learning, what is going on. Um, but uh, you'll be surprised with how many things you've done that actually constitute you as a designer. Right. If you did quality assurance for your day job, that's usability testing. That's exactly what that is. I mean, it's like usability testing has many, many different ways you could perform it, but there's a lot of skills that you can transfer. Uh, I did not include a lot of soft skills on this, but if you, for example, are uh, comfortable with leading large groups of people like teams, guess what? Stakeholder management. Right. Uh, if you constantly negotiate about uh, projects and like things at work, that's again, stakeholder management. That's uh, getting uh, that's negotiation, that's storytelling, that's you becoming a convincing speaker. That's really, really important for design because we have to convince people every day that our work is needed and valuable. Um, as a self taught person in the UX universe, how much time from start to finish were you able to find a job? I understand it's all about portfolio. So, I mean, mine's a little different because I was, it took me three months, right? It took me three months of really disciplined work. Um, but when I say it's complicated, it's because I was a graphic designer most of my life, like out of high school, I was really excited by graphic design. So I had some like UI design chops kind of that way. Um, I also was able to get it quite easily, I would say, is because I had a startup uh, environment that really helped me to just like, create projects uh, by accident, right? So when I say three months, there's like a big fat asterisk next to that. Now, I also went down a route of working with a recruiter and that's exactly how we uh, work through ID Labs, by the way. Um, maybe I should make a whole webinar on working with recruiters, but that is my favorite way of getting work um, and getting our students work because you could get higher salaries that way and you could go quicker. That's why it only took me three months. I worked with a recruiter. Sarah asks, I'd love to, absolutely. I think that's, that would be a great one. Um, um, I'll jot that down. Because there's a whole, 
there's a whole dance that happens with recruiters. So if you do not have specific skills, what I would do is I would look at, um, go on LinkedIn, right? Or our jobs board. And I would look at all the job descriptions and see what keywords are constantly popping up. And I would again, see if my job uh, you know, experiences match any of those keywords that keep popping up and popping up. And if I'm not having some of those experiences in my um, toolbox, you have to make them, you have to um, find them, you have to create them for yourself. You have to learn those skills. So what I would do is I would either redesign uh, product, products and services. I would either, uh, think we can talk about specific actionable steps, but essentially it's, you have to fill in the blanks with new projects that your portfolio is missing. And while you're doing it, also really tell the story as a UX, UX, UX UI designer by using the STAR method, you know, situation, task, action, result, um, but also talk about the context and the impact. Sorry, Janet asks, what do you mean working with a recruiter? So there's various kinds of recruiters. There's a recruiter that works within the company, right? Like, let's say I work for Google, I'm a recruiter for Google, but there's also recruiters who work in agencies. Those are the ones I work with primarily. And they usually work for places like tech, uh, tech systems, creative circle, I don't know, there's a bunch. Right. And they what they do is they put out kind of like ambiguous jobs on the Internet to be like UX designer for Fortune 500 company. Right. That's like what I apply to as a junior designer. And it turns out to be Barclays. Right. So they try not to tell you the name of the company because they want the sale, because if you apply directly to the company, then they lose you as a candidate. So usually that's why the, the, the postings are so ambiguous at first. Then you connect with the recruiter. Um, I did a course with someone because I was looking at recruiters could be tricky, helpful, but tricky. Yes, yes, helpful, but tricky. Recruiters, I have so much to say on this. Um, and after that, they, you basically go down the path of working with a recruiter. It's, to give you guys a 30 second spiel, is you connect with them on the first time, you basically talk about your background. Uh, recruiters typically start working with people who have three years of experience and above. That's the challenge. That's why it's a little bit challenging to work with them for junior, junior, junior designers. That's why I try to make sure that you can chisel your portfolio where if you have extra years of experience, you can bring some of those years into design as much as possible, right? And bring yourself up to that three-year mark. Then you, again, have a conversation for 15 minutes usually to get to know you better. Sometimes recruiters have a job. A lot of times they don't, which is kind of annoying because it's like, why are we talking? But sometimes they just want to get to know you to see if they could add you to the Rolodex. When they say they're going to add you, a lot of times they don't. It's just like a nice way to say, like, I have your business card kind of thing. So I usually like play the field a lot, right? And you talk to many, many, many recruiters. Um, I don't condone affairs in real life, but I condone affairs when it comes to recruiters. So talk to as many as you can. Talk to as many jobs as you can at all times. Um, and essentially, if they like your background and you pass all the green flags, then you can move on to speak with the hiring manager or whoever, you know, whoever's the next line of defense. Um, and that's kind of how you work with recruiters. I think I can definitely choose a lot some time to make a whole event out of this because there's such a special way to work with recruiters. Sometimes recruiters will kind of try to put you into a job that doesn't work for you necessarily, but because they know that we are kind of sometimes hungry for a job, we'll take it. Um, my first job just for everyone else, I drove like an hour and a half sometimes to my job, right? Not definitely something that doesn't really benefit me as much, but I really needed a job in UX. So a recruiter do that, it's a big sale. It's tough to force people to get out of the main city and go somewhere else for an hour and a half, but you gotta do what you gotta do. So if you don't have projects in your portfolio, please make, uh, please find more. Um, if I had to start off and get new projects, what I would do is I would, one approach a bunch of places to see if they need a redesign of their website. Um, you don't need to have this thing come to life, but you need to follow the, the proper end-to-end -end UX process. So research UX, so wireframes, and then of course user interface. That process particularly applies to people who wanna be UX, UX UI designers. If you wanna be a researcher, focus on the research and UX, right? So like the strategy of the information that you're discovering. Um, I would say a healthy amount of portfolio pieces to start off with is like three to five. The more you have, the better. And the case studies don't have to be like, let's say you did a massive, massive, massive project. 
you can make various case studies out of that one project. You could have, let's say, a little piece focused on research, a little piece focused on uh, design system. Maybe you you did a, like a baby design system for it, and then maybe you have one that's like a little bit all like all encompassing, right? And there's your three projects. Boom. Because when people ask you like, hey, do you have research experience? Well, yeah, actually I do. Here it is. Let me show you, right? So a case study doesn't always have to be a full on giant project. It can be a part of the project. Um, so number one is just find somebody who will allow you to redesign their website, right? That's that. Number two, it could be a passion project, right? So if you just have an idea, go for it. Again, it's that whole, if you can cook, you're a chef. If you can redesign a project or a website or create something from scratch and it looks great and you know it's feasible, viable, necessary, et cetera, great. Then you can design and you can kind of talk to that um, passion project. Uh, number three is I would get involved in communities. I really should put all this into the slides. I would get involved into communities um, and I can actually show you there's this great resource list. Um, one pause, sorry guys. There's, we combined, we found about 200 uh, communities for all of you in various cities and places all across the world. So I would go ahead and join those communities to start making some digital friends or real life friends if you can, if COVID is not like super, super intense in, um, in your part of the world. Um, and the way this works by joining communities, oh, okay, fine, that's fine, that looks good. When you join communities, if you there's uh, there's this guy, the research there's sorry, tons of communities all over the world. You can feel free to join whichever. Uh, we've organized them by state, but there's like a million ones online, so you're welcome to join those. Just like you're talking to me today. Um, there's also Meetup.com, which is one of my favorite places to go. Actually, that's funny enough. I met my husband through Meetup.com. You basically search for let's say UX, Philadelphia, and search. And boom, so many wonderful events to go to. Um, and the more you can go to those events, you could even ask, for example, the organizer to get involved and be a volunteer and say like, do you need any people to help you out with like running the events? Um, the reason for this is because when you develop these personal uh, relationships, people start rooting for you. They start giving you like, oh, well, I have this person looking for a junior designer. Do you wanna like, it, this is a much more slower paced uh, way to establish yourself. But look, if nothing else has been working, try this, right? It's worked for me marvelously. It does take a little bit more time though. Um, and then the last thing I would recommend is this guy. Uh, Code for America, maybe? There's one called Code for Philly, uh, but it's basically Code for America, B, Brigades. What a weird term. Um, and there's a bunch of questions, I'll answer them in just one second. So the way that Code for America works is you join this and it's a completely self-paced kind of organization structure. Um, you join a team, they kind of give you a little spiel. You join a team and each team, let's say I, it's all civic-based projects. So let's say I want to redesign um, recycling in Philadelphia, right? So I might have some coding skills, but I'm not a designer. Oh my gosh, I need to cancel this. Sorry guys but I'm not a designer. So I need to find somebody in this code for Philly environment who's a designer and boom, we can work together. And there you go, a mock project that you could add to your portfolio, right? Maybe you can get somebody who's good at sales. I don't know. Or maybe somebody has some uh, marketing chops and you involve all those skills together for a completely self-led civic-based project. So this one is a really great place to find in case you need project work. And it's a lovely place to meet people and fellow nerds. And I'll stop sharing just for a second because there's a lot of questions. How are we doing? I'm trying to be as actionable as I can. A lot of this stuff, by the way, is a lot easier to think through when I have like a specific question in mind. When I give general advice, I'm just like, do this. And sometimes it's not as applicable. So please give me questions and I will happily answer them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I drive an hour to my job. It's my office. Uh, yes, I work remotely and it's, it's pretty good so far. A little bit boring sometimes, but pretty when it's cold, it's, it's nice. There's so many UX processes. Which do you recommend? Double diamond, five elements, design thinking, user center. Um, Heather, this is a question of, depends. Depends on the project. I usually, uh, we teach the double diamond in our bootcamp, but I also, 
incorporate a lot of design thinking, I mean, honestly, they all kind of get you a very similar result, right? It's, it's whatever you prefer the most. It's whatever you utilize. At Walmart, for example, we have the triple diamond, right? It's just another way of thinking. Um, when do you think about research? I have eight years of academic research. That's something, <laughs> yes. Bobby, you could, you could absolutely transfer a lot of those. You might not get a job necessarily with eight years of UX experience, but you could still get something that's not beginner at all. You could get something that's probably mid-level if not more. So yes, a lot of that stuff is absolutely transferable. Do you prefer working with recruiters like Creative Circle or apply positions? I work with um, agencies like Creative Circle, like tech, et cetera. I will find them on LinkedIn and I will reach out and I will say, I am so-and-so and I have six years of experience and I'm looking for such and such profession. Um, let me know if you have anything and you would like to connect. Somebody said, oh, thank you. More about how you met your husband. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> yes, I met my husband through Code for Failure. It's cute. When you know, you know. Uh, can non Americans join Brigade as well? Um, I think it's a pretty, like, there's no rules to join. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure you can. Is it better to have a portfolio that includes the domain specific projects only? Um, Richa, Rika, I apologize for saying your name wrong. Can you elaborate on the word domain specific? Uh, to add more projects to your portfolio, should we do some freelance work before applying to jobs? Always helps. Yes, by the way, in case, okay, here's another great tip, I suppose. If um, folks um, are really, like if you have a profession that is so, 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 so different from UX that you're like, Chris, like I get what you're saying, that's great. Doesn't really apply to me. I'm like, you know, whatever. Call yourself a freelance UI UX designer. Do some projects for you. Find a couple clients. Your clients can literally be like your mom. But just have some projects in your portfolio so that you could be a the UI UX designer. You don't have to call yourself freelance. You could just put the word designer on your resume. But again, this is not me saying that that's going to be easy. You still have to showcase those design chops. So you could call yourself anything you like. It's it's a feeling, right? You're rebranding yourself. You're emulating that profession. Um, but you will have to prove yourself at all times. So it's less about titles and less about the resumes. Do you have the design chops? Are you comfortable with going through the design interviews? Because they will grill you. Of course they'll grill you. Like if they're going to pay you close to six figures for a couple of years of experience, they will absolutely grill you. But that is a really good way to kind of circumvent a lot of those challenges by simply saying that you are a freelance designer and you have your own clients. And that's a really kind of a, a nice way to, like if you have the design chops, then you're a designer, call yourself that. What would be examples of projects? Um, sorry, or last, are Idea Labs courses mostly geared towards US as far as career guidance goes? Uh, yes, yes it is because that's our market. But I think a lot of the stuff that we know is applicable to most of the design world. Um, we do have a student from Japan right now. So I'm excited for that. Um, what would be examples of projects to work for related to UX copywriting? That's a really good question. I am not a copywriter. That's the only problem. If I had to answer that, I'd probably say like, look at a look at a, a website and redesign the copywriting. This is a great example though of what I would do if I don't know a question. We'll go to linkedin.com and find somebody who's a UX copywriter. Actually find like 20 of them and reach out to them with a really personalized approach, right? So you have to connect with the people. You usually click like connect and you write them like a little sentence. It's usually have 300 characters, right? And write them a nice note saying, I really wanna get into UX copywriting. Could I please pick your brain for like 30 minutes? I will warn you designers are extremely busy. So if you don't hear from people or they say no, don't take it to heart, it happens. Meet with those people, whoever says yes, meet with every single one please take that opportunity and ask them about them as much as you can. Um, I've had some people who meet with me that I'm like, why are we meeting? This is a complete waste of my time. Like they don't, they're not ready at all. They, they, they don't know what they want, right? So please have an agenda by the time that you're meeting with a person and ask, what is your day like? How did you get into UX? What would you recommend to somebody who's getting into UX copywriting? And then at the end, write them a really nice thank you letter for their time. 
And I bet you, you're going to find a lot more advice than I can give you because I'm not a copywriter. But that is, by the way, what I did when I was starting out my career. So in that three-month period, I did a lot of informational interviews. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Can you showcase projects that are not research heavy? Can you still? Yes. Um, of course you can. Yeah. Research, by the way, is like nobody expects you to be a generalist of everything. It's just that people expect you to respect research and then incorporate it into your design because just trusting your gut is not enough. It's not enough to me for me to be like, well, I just think it looks prettier. My boss would be like, Chris, that's like not a, that's not an answer. Where is it rooted in? What's the goal that we're like going towards? Where's the research, right? So it's not like you need research at all times. Research, by the way, can be things like competitive analysis, right? Which is something I think a lot of designers like a little bit better. Um, but yes, you mentioned a unique situation coming from background graphic design. You landed UX in three months. How can UX beginner position themselves as well as you were? Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, just do everything I'm recommending, right? It's like showcase a really thorough portfolio. By the way, my portfolio was really bad when I was starting out. So don't think that like there's like a giant standard to meet. Yes, it's going to be still difficult. But people want somebody who has great characteristics, coachable, moldable, malleable, enthusiastic, curious about the product or service that they're solving for. So um, I would start off with just like maybe picking an industry you really like. So I was really, I had like education technology and I was really thorough in that. Um, but just, that's a really broad question. What are your best ways to find recruiter companies? Um, LinkedIn. I would just find people on LinkedIn and I email every single one or excuse me, DM. I connect with every single one. Um, Mackenzie, I apologize. Could you re-ask me the question uh, if you don't mind? Because I think I, if I missed it, that's why. Is it okay to start another related role uh, that's not, what? Is it okay to start in another UX related role that's not the one you want to go for? I'm not sure what you mean by that, probably. I say yes to everything. I'm sorry if you covered this already, but where can you find research resources like earlier done research? Um, NNG, Niels or Norman Nielsen group. Fantastic for research. I can send you guys some research stuff. Um, how do I leverage my existing 10 years of design experience, graphic footwear development to get a job that isn't junior position since I'm technically above junior, not just UX, UI. So there I would focus a lot on the process as well of the strategy. So UX, by the way, UX strategist is a role, not that you need to be a UX strategist, but a strategist has to think about the finances, the business and the user experience um, long-term. So in your work, I'm sure you had to think about the longevity of the company, the longevity of the processes, how are the processes optimized? So you're now focusing on the thorough UX, which isn't necessarily trying to be digital, but it's also like the process that you're creating for whatever task you did. Um, there's also going to be a heavy focus on the skill set that you have. For example, bringing people together in stakeholder, like the stakeholders, stakeholder management, um, user journeys, like flows, like who wants, like really understanding the user who was looking for your kind of shoes and understanding like what is the process for them choosing those shoes and wearing those shoes, right? So now you're focusing on the user journey, which is a lot more UX focused. Um, I can try to answer a little bit more. I would just need to know more about your background because all of it is just comes from like the richness of the day-to-day -day they do and transferring those skills. Oh, sorry, Mackenzie. My question is, what's your opinion on joining hackathons? Do it. Helpful stuff. Uh, I think they, I've never done one, but they seem exhausting, but do it. Bye, Steffi. How do we handle UX junior roles that are fantasizing unicorns? For instance, junior role can be one year of experience, but they request expert level skills. Trends are unfair to ask, do I still apply? Always apply. But yes, the jobs are getting to be extremely um, demanding. Absolutely. That's like the trouble of joining now. Um, even five years ago, I'm sure I joined because you know somebody took a chance at me. But uh, yes, I would try to see if I can kind of create those learning opportunities and case studies for myself outside of the like application right before I'm applying or as I'm applying. Um, but 
So that by the time that you're applying, your resume kind of has those keywords and your portfolio has those case studies. Um, so a lot of times, Aisha, it's not about um, being an expert in these things. It's about the fact that you tried on your free time. For example, if you want to go in UX, there's another roles like UX research or better to start off UX research role or wait UX design. So, oh, I see. Should you be like a generalist and apply to everything, like sprinkle things at the wall? Or what is that called? Just throwing things at the wall, seeing what sticks. I don't think so, personally. I, I think that the more clear you are with your objective, the better. We train all our students to know exactly what they want by the time that they're speaking to recruiters or they're even job searching, because um, the more like kind of like in the wind you are, like, oh, I could do this or I could do that. You know, like a little like a piece of hay people don't take that seriously and they don't know what you want and then it's just you are not as good of an applicant because of that so i would say figure out exactly what you want and try to go for that be kind of a little bit strict about it and if it's really not working then then maybe try something else but at first like be really specific and call yourself a specific field so if you're for example like ux research and design and user interface people could kind of see right through that because you can't be an expert in all fields you kind of have to be thorough in one um, I don't know anything about AR and VR, so I apologize if I'm not asking, answering a question. I'm not an augmented reality designer. <laughs> cool. I only have one client, um, so to Rika or Richa, I apologize. I only have one client work where I worked with stakeholders and graphic designers the rest of my case studies, passion projects. How will I show team player during interview desire? Um, I just say it. Uh, so for example, this is a great question because when people ask me about my design process, I always start off with, well, I am a huge advocate of getting the whole team involved. It might not be true. I actually, sometimes people like, they'll say the stupidest things when you're getting started. But in an interview, you have to say I'm a team player, right? You could highlight it. You could say like, if I'm having uh, freelance projects, I usually start off by really um, creating an atmosphere where everyone is heard. I'm a true team player, right? So you essentially start to talk about how you create a brief and you get everyone's opinions involved and you really do a lot of check-ins, right? Team player, and you do a lot of uh, like participation. So that's essentially how you talk through your design process and you can really hit on that note and literally call yourself a team player. I love that you don't necessarily advocate for putting your labs on resumes. Do you actively have advise people not to put bootcamp certifications? Is there a bootcamp bias against applicants? Yes, sometimes. Because unfortunately, a lot of people release bootcamps in bootcamp applicants into the world without actual skills. Look, I am like this is my hill I'm going to die on. I think that people should absolutely go into UX. And I, I hate that so many boot camps are releasing people with little to no resources in terms of getting a job. Like you, I know because of ID Labs and because of how much coaching we do of the graduates from other boot camps, I know the processes that all, many of them experience. And it's usually like, hey, we have a career coach who is just the therapist. They're not actually going to tell you anything super helpful. I'm sorry, right? And I'm hearing this over and over again where the career coach is basically like, apply to 10 jobs per week right? Um, talk to 10 people, but like how to talk to the people? What are you asking them for? And these folks who are graduating these other boot camps are coming to us for help because we actually take them seriously and we actually personalize their learning um, or we give them personalized approaches and it overnight they get jobs. Like it's incredible. But that's why, I mean, I, I probably would not put that I'm a graduate of a boot camp on my resume, it's not going to help me. It's not going to save me. It's I would probably put that I'm a freelance designer and uh, show my work and really, really, really work my ass off to make my work amazing. Like that, that's really it. Um, is there bias? Yes, simply because of how boot camps have um, fumbled the bag. Uh, Google certification, by the way, released like what a quarter million designers last year. How? <laughs> like how? how is that like feasible it's just not a, a, a small percentage of those people are actually going to get jobs and it's really sad i love the necessarily i'm already enrolled UX, but it doesn't help with placement do you offer a separate program for job placement kind of sort of 
Um, so my partner and I are going to be next deep into teaching starting February into like May, but we do have mentors who are vetted and wonderful and diverse and incredible and they have a ton of different perspectives to give you. If I am honest with you, um, I did not understand to what degree people need a mentor before I started actually mentoring people for our bootcamp. I didn't realize how much work there is with personalizing the way that people get into UX, even things like how to tell your story, right? That has everything to do with whether you get hired or not. Understanding like how to transfer your skills from whatever it is that you do into the job. And each job, like just to, get, I'm happy to tell you how we prep people, by the way, we look at every single job we pick out the keywords and then we try to make sure to highlight your keywords at, from your background to fit that job description as you're speaking to the interviewer, right? So we go so granular to make sure that you get every single opportunity, but it's because of such like a thorough, thorough, thorough approach to your background. So you don't have to choose our mentors if you need a mentor but I suggest finding a mentor and paying them for that time because you're going to need to have a really personalized approach as you're job searching. Absolutely. And that's kind of like the dirty reality that I did not realize until I started teaching people. I was like, wow, I, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. It's almost like nepotism in a way. And that's a little bit sad. Um, if there's other questions, I'm happy to answer them. We only have a few minutes left and I have some other slides I can show you guys. All these will be of course sent out to you, but um, please master at least one prototyping tool. Uh, Figma is free now, by the way, uh, up to a certain level of projects. I believe it's free. Um, Janice, what do you mean it's like nepotism? So nepotism in its purest form is when you get opportunities because you're either related to somebody or you like know somebody at a company, right? UX is kind of similar right now as well. I mean, a lot of professions are, but I didn't realize to what degree. Um, for example, when I look for jobs as a senior designer, I don't go to a job board. Um, I always just go through my network. I'll text my friends. I'll text my recruiter friends. I don't go to a job description ever. Jobs are sent to me and that's because I know people, which is kind of like nepotism. Same thing with mentorship. Like when we have our students, we re like we pitch them to our recruiter friends first. We don't release them to the wild and say, go and search for jobs. We never, ever, ever do that. We get you chiseled out to the fact that you can speak to recruiters really, really well. And we pitch you to our recruiter friends and then recruiters actively search for jobs on your behalf. Nepotism kind of, right? It's all about who you know. And that's really unfortunate, but it's also how I've seen the people get hired the best and get the best salaries. So master at least one tool, in this case, it's Figma. Fantastic. You will absolutely need to use this on a daily basis. Um, there's also Envision if you sketch, this is probably not necessary now in 2022 when sketch is dying off. I feel so bad. It's like my first born child. Um, but uh, learn Figma. It'll be amazing. By the way, there's like a million and one resources for Figma. I also just wanted to share because I know we're uh, coming up on time and I want to share some uh, resources for web links and all that good stuff in case somebody wants to utilize them. Um, but yeah, learn Figma. If you need resources, there's so many really wonderful, like Figma does a great job with video tutorials. Practice them. I need to use them all. I'm still practicing Figma, to be honest. Um, in fact, Walmart, so I work for Walmart full-time. Walmart just ended their contract with Sketch and now we're using Figma full-time. So Figma is like, Figma stole so much of the market share. Um, Sarah asked, is it okay to only know Figma? Like, so there's always going to be more tools, like which, what kind of design tools are they asking for? Because by the way, if you know Figma, you know Sketch, you know Adobe XD, they're all similar. They're all extremely, extremely similar. Figma is becoming more advanced because Figma started listening to their customers and solving for a lot of the problems that we kept complaining about for years with Sketch. So that's why Figma is winning right now. But yes, if you know one, you know them all. But if you know Photoshop, you do not know Figma, just, just to be clear. 
Photoshop and Figma are two very different products, right? It does help to have Adobe suite experience. You might be asked about that, but Photoshop, for example, or Illustrator are very different from Figma, just so we are clear. Um, I'll include this, but it's essentially uh, to get real life. So the last one, the least steps is like good real life experience. <laughs> they connect wires. <laughs> Um, to get real life experience, I've kind of covered a lot of this, like hackathon, startup weekend, help a small business, pitch a small startup. The resource list is how I would also go about like starting those connections and building slowly. This is a mock project that I always share. And this is from uh, Apple Music. This guy wanted to apply to Apple Music. He did not get in. And so he put out his uh, um, case study into the world. And this got like 68,000 hits on Medium. It's not about the hits. It's about the fact that I bet you a big percentage of that 68,000 are hiring managers who are like, yeah, this is pretty great stuff. I don't care if Apple didn't hire you, I'll hire you. I have to get a link to this. I literally never have a link and then oh, it's such a mess, but I love this article so much. He really went in deep about what he would redesign and I'm pretty bad that I got a job out of it. Like look how beautiful. This is all a mock project. And then get ready for interviews. I should, this is another one I should probably just do a whole webinar on, which is essentially how to pass UX interviews. But a design interview has about two to four rounds where you start off, the first one is usually like, um, you talk to a recruiter of some sort or the HR person. Then you start talking to the like designers, like junior level designers, maybe the senior designers, the hiring manager. You might also talk to some periphery people is there a link for a dog called Janet? I have to find it. I'll include it in the, in the slides for sure because I think it's such a good one. Um, then you might also talk to periphery people. So like IT or marketing. Thank you, Heather. Somebody always looks it up. I always feel so bad. Um, so those are the people that you need to be like, I'm great at teamwork, right? They're, they're the ones who are going to ask you about teamwork and project management, less about design. So that's why you always get like a few, like an engineer or like a marketing person thrown in there. Um, you might also get what is called a whiteboard challenge or a design challenge. Those are either, either like a pop quiz on the job or a take home. One of my proudest accomplishments is one of our students became, she was customer service for Vanguard and she had this huge imposter syndrome, like giant. She was so terrified of UX interviews. And I honestly felt like I was sending her off to war every time she had an interview. I felt horrible, but you have to let the baby bird go. And she got a whiteboard challenge uh, unannounced. Like the interview did not have the fact that they're gonna have a whiteboard challenge. And a whiteboard challenge is a pop quiz, basically. It's, um, they sit you down and they're like, hey, you have an hour to complete this assignment and talk to us about how you would solve this challenge. Each whiteboard challenge is a little bit different. I've never done one, so I'm not an expert in talking about this. I've done many design challenges, but never a whiteboard challenge. And she passed, she got the job. And I was like, what a wonderful way to, you know, really have the stamp of approval to say like, you got hit with a pop quiz and you passed with flying colors because you got a job offer out of it. So, you know, it's, there's a whiteboard challenges are more about the way that you think you're never going to have enough time in one hour to design something brilliant. It's about the approach. That's what they're asking about. A design challenge is a little bit more design heavy. So like showcasing your UI skills and again, that thought pr process, but there's of course gonna be a million and one different questions on kind of depending on who's interviewing you. Um, there's gonna be screener questions and all of these relate to essentially how you tell the story really, really well. Um, your approach, so important, like design, like the way you approach it, how do you solve problems, et cetera. Technical UX questions about your um, aptitude. I'll include all this so you guys are not, you don't have to take screenshots or anything. And that is the end. If you have questions for me, I know this is kind of fast, but um, if you have questions for me, please reach out on Slack. Um, <laughs> yes, and you will get a copy of this PowerPoint for sure. I will send out an email right after this. That concludes our event today. If you have any questions, I should include Slack, should I? Yes, I should. We also have a bunch of other events coming up um, this month. Some taught by me, some taught by my partners. So please join us. They're all a little different, a little fun. And thank you so much for your questions and your attendance today. I'll stay on for a little bit longer, but um, if you have any specific questions I can answer.
but that is our presentation. Stop recording.